Good evening. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. Um, my name is Virginia Salem. I'm the chair of the Culinary Arts Committee on behalf of our club president, David Doty, and the Culinary, Culinary Arts Committee members. We welcome you to Bourdain, the definitive oral, oral biography with Laurie Willover. And of course, moderated by our committee member, Gordon Kendall. Thank you, Gordon, oh, for arranging all oh. of this. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to thank our other um, culinary arts committee members who may be able to hear me now. Uh, we have Bill Todd, of course, and um, Nico Lowry, our, which is our, right in front yes, of our us. Ar artistic impresario, Mr. Nico Lowry himself. And thank you for joining us here in the Grand Gallery. And for those of you who are joining us live stream via YouTube, hi, Mom and Dallas. Uh, <laughs> we're, glad, we're glad you're here. So with that, uh, Lori, welcome. And um, we will get some slides started that will be uh, an ongoing narrative in the background. If you see anything that looks interesting and you'd like to ask a question about, uh, please feel free to uh, step in and ask a question along the way. But otherwise, we are going to dive in with Bourdain, the definitive biography. And so I think the, f the first question, Lori, is how did, uh, how did you come to work, to know and come to work with Anthony? Well, first of all, good evening. Hello, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm really... Uh, thrilled to see such a, a full room of people that are interested in this book and interested in, in Tony Bourdain. Can you speak louder? Yes. Louder? Yes. Okay. The question was, <laughs> can you speak you. louder <laughs> and more slowly? And yes, I can. And thank you. So, <laughs> uh, so how did I come to work with Anthony Bourdain? Uh, I was a culinary school graduate uh, in the early 2000s, I had worked for several years with another chef, Mario Batali, another kind of giant of the industry, uh, and was looking for my next job. And Mario introduced me to his new friend, uh, Anthony Bourdain, who had just published his bestseller, Kitchen Confidential. And he had a contract to write several more books, one of which was a cookbook called Anthony Bourdain's Leal Cookbook. And this was, of course, a reflection of the uh, bistro on Park Avenue South and 29th Street called Leal, where he was working when he broke through as a best-selling author. And he needed someone to help him uh, edit and test and refine the recipes that the restaurant used every day in the kitchen and make them into uh, cookbook style recipes. So I was hired to do that job. So that was how I first began to work with him back in 2002. The book was published in 2004. Uh, you can still buy it and it's a great cookbook and I know I'm biased but it really is uh, a very classic great French cookbook. Uh, and then several years later after I had worked in magazine publishing I had a baby. I wanted to sort of change my professional trajectory, do something that was a little more flexible I reached out to probably 50 people I knew and said, if you know of anything editorial, uh, you know, clerical, I'll alphabetize your clothespins, I'll do anything. I just, I want a part-time job. I want to get out of the magazine world. And Tony, I think, was the only person who actually responded to me and said, oh, my assistant is actually leaving. Would you want to be my assistant? I know it's not, maybe not your dream job. Uh, in fact, it was my dream job. And I said, yeah, absolutely, let's, let's do it. So I was his assistant from 2009 until the end of his life in 2018. Well, if, uh, if I may ask a, a slightly technical culinary question that I think you would be well positioned. I think it's fair to say that almost all of us uh, are, like to eat. And many, uh, many of us also attempt to cook, and some of us actually are able to cook. I'm not, I'm not among them. But if um, you had any advice to give uh, a home chef from your work with Anthony and translating traditional French dress dr dishes into um, American kitchens, what, uh, what advice would you give from a technical perspective? 
Ooh. Well, I, I don't know that there's that much that needs to change really from a, from a French uh, culinary perspective, trying to, to make that happen in an American kitchen, especially now I think we have access to just about everything that you could want in terms of ingredients, in terms of, uh, of tutorials, uh, you know, with the, with the advent of streaming video, it's never been easier to say, well, gosh, how do I, how do I dice an onion? And you, you know, there are a million videos that are gonna show you exactly how to do it. So we're very, very lucky. Uh, you know, I would say the best quality ingredients that you can find and that you can afford. And again, we're very lucky now in this era to have access to things like French butter and, um, you know, sea salt from Normandy. And so, uh, you know, don't go crazy. Don't buy a million things. Uh, you know, start really, really simply, just like we did in culinary school. The first few weeks were how to chop an onion, how to peel a carrot, you know, how to... Uh, Truss a chicken, you know, starting very simply and, and building your, your repertoire uh, slowly, I think, is the way to go. So, so you're saying the one, the one ingredient that at least I know I don't have is patience? <laughs> well, that's, that helps, yeah. And, you know, a glass of wine if, uh, if all else fails. <laughs> my, 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 my problem is more goes into me than in the chicken. <laughs> ah, yes. A common malady. <laughs> well, if I may, moving, moving on to our book of the evening, um, the definitive oral biography. How did that come to be out of your work and your experience with, uh, with Tony? Sure, so I had, in addition to the Leal cookbook that I spoke about, uh, we also, we wrote another cookbook together uh, published in 2016 called Appetites. Uh, and so I had this uh, experience of, of writing books with Tony. And in fact, we were starting on a new project called World Travel and a Reverent Guide, which is a, a Two, we, we published two books in 2021. That was the, the first. The second was the oral biography. So I had this history of, of collaborating with Tony on books. Uh, unfortunately, when he died, we hadn't done that much work on world travel. So my job for the next few years was to, uh, was to finish that book and get it published. At the same time, uh, there was a conversation with our publisher, Dan Halpern, who was then at uh, Echo, uh, and Tony's agent, Kim Witherspoon, uh, about what sorts of projects might make sense going forward uh, and how to really uh, capture the best of Tony and his legacy uh, in, the, in the written word uh, in, a, in a format that he was, that really, you know, being a writer and publishing books really were, was, that was the thing that, that sort of rocketed him out, rocketed him out of obscurity. So the idea came up for an oral biography uh, rather than a deeply researched uh, traditional biography. And that was going to be my, my next question. This is styled as the definitive oral biography, and you'll find that an oral biography takes a, a much different approach and a much different style. And can you talk to us about that, the difference sure. between a traditional historic biography and an oral biography. Absolutely. This was not really a format that I was myself all that familiar with and I had to sort of educate myself quickly on what is an oral biography. Uh, and a lot of people uh, in asking me about it think, oh, it's, it's an audio book, right? Well, no, it, we do have an audio book format, but, uh, but it is, uh, it's the telling of a story, uh, in, in this case, the, the story of a person's life through the recorded stories of the, of the people that made up their, their friend group, their colleagues, their family, uh, people, uh, you know, in Tony's case, people he knew from birth all the way through to the end of his life. Uh, so I spoke with his now late mother, I spoke with his brother, uh, his, his young daughter, uh, lots and lots of uh, classmates from high school and culinary school. Um, there are stories from people that he worked with in the 1970s through the late 1990s in kitchens. Uh, lots and lots of the people that were his creative partners in making television, publishing books, uh, producing films, uh, people that had personal relationships with him. So it's sort of a different way to tell someone's story. I think it really worked particularly well for him because Tony was someone who was often telling his own story. Kitchen Confidential is really an autobiography uh, in the form of a memoir, in the form of a hilarious 
nonfiction look behind the scenes of the restaurant industry. And throughout uh, his television career, he continued to tell the story of his life. I mean, there's so much of his biography sort of woven into uh, so many episodes of, of television that he made. So this was a way to tell his story from a different perspective. There he is blow-drying a chicken. <laughs> blow-drying a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's an outtake from, from our cookbook, Appetites. Uh, there's a lot of really, there's some beautiful, straightforward food photography in that book, and there's also some, some uh, a different type of uh, style. That's another one. He's got a, uh, a whole boar's head on a, on a tray uh, in, his, in his own living room, uh, and that's, I believe, on the back cover of the book. We had a, a really good time uh, making that book. Well, what, um, what struck me about the oral biography was that even though these are disparate interviews from so many different people, there was a thematic links that um, tied the chapters together and chaptered the stories that we were discussing his early early days, just even line chef with the manager of the restaurant who said, oh, he kind of rattled my cage. He, 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 did, he did French and we did Italian. And you pick up on all of those threads. Was it, was it difficult to put all those threads together and into to building your narrative the way you did? Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, the, the people were so generous, extraordinarily generous with their stories, especially in a time when uh, with very few exceptions, we were all grieving our friend uh, and, and continue to, to grieve the loss of, of our friend, our mentor, our colleague, uh, in some cases, family member. So the difficulty came in, uh, you know, just just processing the, the loss in real time with people who also were, were acutely and continue to acutely feel that loss. Um, you know, it, it definitely, it was a, an intellectual exercise in, in deciding sort of the, the arc of different narratives. Uh, you know, I found it very uh, illuminating to talk to people who maybe didn't know each other or came from different parts of Tony's life but had very similar experiences and very similar patterns that they noticed or ways in which they thought maybe their interactions with Tony were unique, and in fact, this was these were things that illustrated the way he was. Uh, for instance, I'll just tell my own uh, illustration yeah, of that. Yeah, uh, when I first met Tony, I was very surprised uh, to find him a shy, slightly socially awkward, kind of quiet guy. I uh, didn't really make that much eye contact. And I had just read Kitchen Confidential. This was in 2001. So I was really expecting this sort of pirate, you know, to come and kind of slap me across the face and tell me to get to work. And uh, it was not that way at all. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe it's me. You know, maybe he's, maybe I make him feel awkward or, or he's, you know, he doesn't know me and he's on his best behavior. And um, even, you know, as much as long as I worked with him and as it's at times as closely as we worked together, there was always a little bit of a remove. And I always assumed, well, I just there must be something about me that that makes him just hold a little bit back. And in talking to any number of people who worked very closely with him, who traveled around the world with him or who were themselves very, very well accomplished, uh, for instance, Anderson Cooper, uh, probably one of the, the biggest names that I interviewed for the book, there was that same observation of, I really like this guy, I think we have a lot in common, we respect each other, and I wish that I could get to know him a little bit better. There was a kind of remove and a kind of way that he held himself back a little bit that I think was a common uh, observation that people had, no matter where they fit into his life. Do I, I recall from the uh, the biography that he was um, really a very precocious child? That he was academically very gifted to the point that in elementary school, his uh, uh, excuse me, his um, teachers and principals were recommending to his parents that they put him in private school. He was so advanced, and he was you know, teased, and I would say bullied, as we would say. Now, do you think that early early background may have created this, um, this protective shell around him, or? 
It's entirely it possible. possible. Yeah, you know, I, I try. I've. It's very easy to slip into a role of uh, armchair diagnostician <laughs> or armchair therapist, and it's it's very tempting. And you know, there's all of this evidence and all this information. I, I try really hard not to pick up pieces of the merit narrative and make a definitive declaration, just because. You know, we're also we're also complex, but certainly he was a very very intelligent person, and Fair enough. I think any of us who were you know intelligent and sensitive growing up uh, try and probably protect ourselves from from those among us who were oh, given surely. to bullying. Uh, of course, <laughs> of course that that makes sense. It just that struck me. Um, I think like like many people, I thought. I kind of know this guy, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. that um, he's a, a great chef, he's got a showbiz personality, and yet the more I read about him, the more I found, you know, layers of complexity, and to use a, to use a, a Ponzi, a, a Ponzi description, he would probably hate, he's as complex as some of his sauces. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Uh, I, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Oh, uh, well, we'd be happy to take one now if you've got one, sir. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm I think I'm hearing a hint. <laughs> oh, all right. Would you... Uh Uh oh. Well, uh oh. <laughs> well, as 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 my as my late father used to say, you can always ask. We don't have to answer. <laughs> I, I I do. Yeah. I I think that's a pretty well established fact. Yes. Okay. Well, there we go. Well. Um, I guess this next question is going to be anticlimactic after that, <laughs> but um, what, what might a casual fan of Anthony Bourdain's be surprised about in, for, in learning from your book? Uh, so, uh, you know, what I was saying before about, about Tony being a, a kind of a quiet, uh, you know, socially awkward guy, uh, I, I think that, I think if you only knew him from watching the television show where he was, uh, very authentically being himself, funny, brash, confident, uh, you know, able to kind of uh, run a table and, and, and yet still be a very good listener. All of those things were authentic to who he was, but I, I don't think there was a lot of that shyer, quieter, more introspective part of him that made it into the television cut or, uh, you know, even his books. You know, he has a very uh, specific voice and and so I think people would be surprised to see that he was somebody who who did occasionally struggle with you know anxiety self-doubt uh, you know all of the sort of darker things that uh, that that people discuss uh, people addressed in the interviews that I that are in the book I, I, I see well real quick just to um, backtrack slightly on your process did you find this was mostly uh, in-person interviews, or did you uh, just tell us the physical process of gaining this information to put the book together for those of us who, when we're not cooking, attempt to write? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I started very early, probably too early after Tony's death, about two months after uh, the, you know, the, the book started, um, you know, the contract came through and we started working, I started working on it. And so they were mostly in-person uh, interviews for a while. Uh, at the same time, I was also working on the World Travel book, and that was due a year before uh, the biography. So it was sort of something I was doing in the background. I was trying to do as many in-person interviews as I could, uh, de depending on whether or not people were willing. Are they available uh, uh, physically and emotionally? Because right. I'm sure they were, were processing, too. That's something that I've noticed from many of the quotes. Uh, in the bio, in the, his uh, obituary, that you could tell people were still struggling with how to even come to terms with it themselves. Of all of all you're, you're, you're putting together. Well, moving on from that, um, you traveled, of course, with him a great deal because travel was so much, particularly in his later year, uh, was travel and travel 
documentary was so much a part of his narrative about food. So how, what, were, what was it like to travel with him? What, what, what stories could, what, what stories could, what stories could you possibly have <laughs> sure. traveling with a man like Anthony sure. Bourdain? Sure, <laughs> yeah. I was very lucky to take a number of trips uh, at a certain point uh, when it was clear I was going to stick around, be in this job for a while, and my, my son was a little bit older and I could you know, leave for a week or two at a time and, and not completely freak out. I started going on uh, one big trip a year with the crew as they, they shot the, the um, episodes. Uh, so I went to Vietnam as for my first trip. I went to Okinawa, Japan. Uh, the following year, we went to Kanazawa and Tokyo, Japan, uh, and then Sri Lanka, and then the Philippines, and the last trip was in Hong Kong in 2018. Uh, each one of these trips was spectacular. I mean, the fact that I did them one after the other after the other, I, I extraordinarily lucky. Uh, and Tony was very generous about... Uh, getting me a business class ticket and, you know, staying in the nice uh, accommodations. And it really pretty much spoiled me forever uh, traveling to Asia again, uh, unless I can, you know, find someone to underwrite my, uh, my tastes for luxury. Um, no, no, that, that's, it's not luxury, it's practical. Yeah, well, true, <laughs> true. Uh, so, you know, each trip was its own just incredible experience. Uh, you know, going to Vietnam, I had never been uh, in Asia before anywhere. So to go to this place that was, uh, you know, one of his favorite places to visit that he knew so much about, but we all uh, were in, we were in central, Asia, uh, sorry, sorry, central Vietnam in Hue, uh, where none of us in the crew had ever been before. And so to see Vietnam, uh, this new part of Vietnam for Tony through his eyes. Uh, and I was, you know, I was a very uh, green traveler. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, you know, I, I think I showed up with my laptop and a pillowcase. And, you know, I was just kind of a mess. And I think he could see that, that I was not really experienced. Um, it was really said, listen, you know, any time that, uh, that they're not filming me and I'm on my scooter, because they would always rent him a scooter to, to ride around uh, the streets, you can ride with me. And so I got to see this beautiful city of Hue uh, from the back of a scooter uh, being driven by Tony Bourdain. And, you know, I had been his assistant for about six years at this point, so I was like, I didn't think that I was starstruck, but I was like, I can't. But this, is ha this is happening. Like I'm, wow. this is, you know, I'm truly doing this thing, and it was, um, you know, I was very nervous at first, and I thought, oh, this is how people die, you know, going, um, and uh, you know, he was an excellent, uh, really safe scooter driver. He knew exactly how to. If any of you have ever been to Vietnam, you know, it's very, um, it's a whole different thing. There's not really crosswalks or street lights or any kind of right of way situation. It's very, uh, if you don't really know it, it's very, very. Um, disconcerting and uh, so that was a you know thrilling experience I'll tell another quick story uh, we were uh, going from Kanazawa Japan to Tokyo uh, taking a train uh, taking the the Shinkansen the bullet train across the country uh, and the crew were taking a van uh, with all of the you know hundreds of cases of equipment and cameras and everything and Tony and I were the only ones taking the train um, and the producer gave us, uh, you know, our paper tickets. And, you know, at this point, I'm thinking, well, like, I, you know, I have a little more confidence as a traveler. And I'm, and I'm thinking, well, and Tony knows what he's doing. You know, he's been traveling the world for 15 years at this point. And, uh, and he's extremely excited. We're standing on the platform. He's extremely excited to see a, um, a coffee machine. These coffee machines that you often see in, in Tokyo and other parts of Japan that where you can buy a, um, a hot can of coffee which is disgusting. Uh, you know, it's not good coffee, but it's a, a cool novelty thing. And he was very excited to show this to me. He goes, oh, look, there's the, the, let's go get the coffee. And he's pulling, you know, coins out of his pocket to get the coffee before the train comes. And I see his train ticket just sort of flutter out of his pocket oh. onto the platform. And it's a windy spring day and the train's coming. And I'm thinking, oh my God, where he's about to lose his ticket. He doesn't even know, like, how... How is this, you know, how is this Tony Bourdain, you know, the expert world traveler about to lose his train ticket? Um, I was able to grab the ticket for him and give it back to him. And, you know, I didn't make a big deal about it. And, and I just thought, okay, well, even someone with this much experience and this much, this many miles on him, sometimes you, you, you screw up. You leave your passport in the safe or you drop your train ticket or... Um, you know, things happen. I was just in a hotel uh, a few weeks ago, and my friend lost the the, the key, and the, you know, it was it just 
things happen. And oh, it's, my, it was, I, I threw away a visa one time. That was fun. <laughs> So it's, it was a nice reminder of just like, we're all just humans trying to do our best. Well, I, absolutely, especially travel at any time. But so after, whether you were in Vietnam or Japan, after you got off the scooter <laughs> and you were at one of the famous markets that he would walk through, I, there were so many mm -hmm. in, in, in his, his programs. How, what was it like? Share with us walking through one of these incredible markets and what, what was it like with him? Was it with like every booth, I've got to see this, or it was like, no, we're, look, we're looking for this. We're look, did he, how, how, how did he approach, this was his element, this was his milieu. Sure. What was he like in, in his milieu? Well, you know, to be completely honest, in those instances uh, when it was for television, there was a there was a set there was a, a goal uh, and there had been an advanced crew of of you know, who had gone several hours before to set up lighting this to make sure you know to set the path and to uh, talk to the vendor about you know this is the the soup that we're going to serve on camera and you know so there wasn't necessarily I, I think that the the shows are very successful in uh, creating the illusion of spontaneity and the illusion of discovery but the truth is. You know, this stuff uh, happens with, uh, you know, with a large budget and a lot of very talented, very uh, creative people. Uh, so I'd say the more sort of spontaneous, exciting moments came when there were no cameras around. Yeah, uh, we, were exactly. in, um, we were in Shinjuku, in the, the, the neighborhood in, in um, Tokyo, that's very lively and uh, lots of bars and restaurants, a lot of young people. And he wanted to, uh, he said, well, let's, and I had never been to Tokyo before, so it was all very new to me. And he said, let's go to the Golden Guy. And there's just these tiny little warrens of street after street after street with little tiny bars that have maybe six seats or eight seats. Yeah, so and there was just this childlike wonder at, you know, showing me, oh, yeah, I went to that one once. And oh, look at that one. There's, you know, there's, this one's got a guitar theme and this one's got a, you know, a rat theme. Or, I mean, it just, there was this real um, genuine excitement about, not necessarily discovering it for himself, but being able to show someone, another human being in real life, something that he thought was really cool. And I felt you know, extraordinarily lucky to have a couple of experiences like that with him. Well, that, that's amazing, because mine, I like, like many of us, was just from what I saw on television. But even then, you, you did sense that he, that he wanted to, she wanted, you're gonna think this is gross, but it's the best thing you've had. You've got to understand mm -hmm. what, and and I think that was he wanted to bring that larger understanding of uh, what what food means to so many people and what we can all learn from that. Mm -hmm. um, although it, I, I think it will take a while. Was it in, in Mexico? Was the insects? Um, Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, <laughs> and, 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 and things on sticks in Asia that I, I, don't, think he, I don't think he fully identified. Sure, before. yeah. There was a, especially in the beginning, there was a lot of that. You know, I think uh, as he, you know, he sort of pioneered this, this style of travel television that was pushing boundaries and was trying new things and getting out of the country clubs and the golf clubs and the three-star restaurants and really, you know, showing people the rest of the world, the rest of the food. Exactly. His, his quote, do we really want to go through life in a Pope mobile eating at McDonald's all mm -hmm. the time? He mm -hmm. was determined that he wasn't going to do that. That was for sure. But I will say, um, when he was in, 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 in France and in the, the, in the traditional, uh, he, he did come alive. Uh, you, mm -hmm. saw, you saw those traditional roots that he learned at CIA coming out mm -hmm. very, very much. Did he, did he try to blend these th these formal and informal cultures in his uh, in his own cooking with you since you you cooked with him as well what what was it like to eat and cook with him based on this experience yeah so we uh, in in preparing for uh, and developing recipes for our cookbook appetites uh, we did have a couple of instances where we would cook together in his home kitchen trying out ideas making sure you know this or that I thing he worked uh, and I would I would not say that he was uh, that he blended high and low or old and new. I think it was he had room in his repertoire for classic things that he had learned at the CIA, and he had a real love for true classic. I mean, uh, you know, Blanquette de Vaux and uh, celery remoulade, and you know, the old sauces and all these things that that really you know that 
that those were the things that he was learning on when he was in the, you know, in the 1970s at the CIA. He really, really always loved those things, but he also was perfectly thrilled with, uh, you know, the, the latest, uh, you know, the, the evolution of all of the ramen and the noodle bars and Mission Chinese and all of these um, new to him things that were coming up in the in the 2010s in New York. So I think, and and to the extent that he had the time and, and capacity, he would try and, you know, we have, uh, you know, Korean fried chicken in our, in our book and we have, you know, uh, uh, super, super classic uh, old recipes as well. So I think he would just, he just sort of had an appetite for the full gamut of experience. He wasn't somebody who rejected tradition or rejected classical cuisine. If you've seen the episode uh, of Parts Unknown in Lyon, France, I mean, that is just as old school classic as it gets. And, and the reverence and the respect that he paid to those chefs and that tradition was, you know, there was not an ounce of snark in that episode. Uh, he really just, just loved it. Um, uh, truly, truly uh, we was. We have another uh, question. Yes, there we go. Yes, sir. Hmm. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, to the extent that uh, this was someone who who made a lot of dark jokes. I mean, if you've read any of his books or watched uh, his television shows, I mean, he made a million uh, really, you know, had a very, very dark sense of humor. So I don't think it was a secret or I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sure. Intimately is not necessarily the how I would characterize it, but I'm sorry. You're using that word loosely. Sure. <laughs> well, well, if 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 I may, um, one of the quotes that I read in his his in, in his obituary was when it came to his success, mm -hmm. he um, he said he felt like he had stolen a car, a really nice car and was driving away, hell for leather in it, and he kept looking up in the mirror because he kept thinking the cops were gonna be behind him. So I, I, I think there was always, um, well, I, I, let me rephrase that. Um, help us understand, this is kind of the duality idea, but that it, 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 it was a struggle for him. Here he was, a very classically trained chef who had been on the line, had done everything in the kitchen, and yet all of a sudden, with his talent and his drive and ambition was really now an international success. And uh, maybe some of the darkness, was it coming from trying to just grapple with just how to, how to walk on two sides of the same coin? Hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to say. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, when he was very aware that his success came not only from having a, a great talent for the written word and for having worked really hard to write a best-selling book, but also that it was, uh, in some ways, the, a, a matter of the right place at the right time. You know, it was lightning in a bottle. Uh, and I think that, you know, it is true that the better that you are and the harder you work, that, you know, luck seems to come more to someone like that. So. Uh, it's not at all to dismiss, uh, you know, his his talent and his and his hard work. But I think he was, uh, you know, it, it was sort of a one in a million situation, and I think he never uh, never lost sight of that, and never lost sight of the fact that he had, uh, you know, been a, a worker among worker and had workers and had struggled uh, for a long time financially uh, as a as a cook, you know, doing what he loved, but you know, never paying his rent on time, never, uh, you know, returning calls from American Express, having, you know, tax... Uh, <laughs> no, none of us do that. <laughs> it's never good news. Yeah, no. Uh, so I, th I think he just, you know, having having worked and, and struggled for a long time, I think it was just natural I, I, that that he, he knew that it could all it could all go away. Well, nothing was guaranteed. Well, um, on that end, you know, you, you had worked with him so much on the the nonfiction with the, the cookbooks and the travel writing. Would you like to speak a little about his fiction, in particular his detection fiction writing, mm -hmm. like 
Gone Bamboo and the story of Typhoid Mary. And did he ever talk with you about writing more fiction or seeing himself as a fiction author or um, help help us put that piece of, of, of the equation together if you can. Sure. So he wrote two uh, detective novels, two crime novels really uh, that are really fun and they have not gotten as much attention as uh, Kitchen Confidential and the subsequent uh, other books that he's written. But they're really, they're fun, they're funny, they're very lively, very fast paced. And uh, just because I think of you know the volume of books that get published every year, they just they didn't make the same kind of splash that uh, Kitchen Confidential did. There's just it's just you know the publishing business is what it is. Uh, to the extent that you know after the second one didn't do well, that same publisher passed on Kitchen Confidential because they thought, well, we can't really take oh. a we can't take a chance on this guy. His second book didn't sell very well, uh, and this this story is told in great detail in the in the biography. Uh, so that was his first love, but I think, you know, once you break through with nonfiction and, and this is what the people want and this is the commercial exactly. success, I think it's hard to go back and, and, and do fiction. I think that, you know, had he lived a longer life, I think, sure, he, he very well could have gone back and written, an, uh, you know, an, another several very good novels. Uh, he was, he had this sort of interest in, in many genres, uh, and, and especially as, as he was getting older, I think he was interested in sort of maybe getting a little more behind the camera, maybe doing some, some screenplays. I mean, I think he, he, he really could have done anything. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk that much about, about those things, but, uh, but I think it was absolutely within his capacity to return to that form. You mentioned Typhoid Mary. I just, yes. want, I just want to clarify, that is actually a historical uh, yes, that, work. And it's uh, historical gosh, fiction. It's not. It's not. It's a, it's a. It's a telling of the story of Typhoid okay, Mary. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, you know, when when COVID started, I thought, God, I you know, millions of reasons why I wish Tony were still here. But I thought, this is a guy who was so interested in medical oddities and weird. Uh, you know, and he wrote a whole book about Typhoid Mary. And you know, what a shame in a in a sort of sick way that he's missing this <laughs> global pandemic. He would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, we have a question in the second row. What are you working on now, and what do you think? So the question is, what am I working on now, and how does my work with Tony inform that work? Uh, I have just finished a draft, uh, co-authored uh, a sourdough baking book, uh, which is um, mm. uh, with with the baker Richard Hart, I should say. Who, uh, if any of you have been to Copenhagen, he has Hart Bakery in Copenhagen, some of the best bread and baked goods uh, in the world. He's Richard is just a really, um, really talented guy. He was the head baker at Tartine for six years and then went to Copenhagen and opened the bakery. Uh, he's now working on opening a new place in Mexico City, so get psyched for that. Uh, so that's very, that was for me a necessary break from working on Bourdain-related uh, projects, uh, you know, after, Losing him and then quickly writing two books, I, I felt like I needed to take a break. Uh, and what I'm doing now is uh, working on a memoir of my own uh, stories about my time in the in the restaurant industry, working with Tony, working with Mario Batali, uh, and all the complicated things that that come up uh, in uh, in the shadow of of giants. Oh my! And we have a question from our very own Edwina Sandys. So the question is, am I good at cooking myself, and do I spend time in the kitchen? Uh, I also went to culinary school. I uh, graduated from the French Culinary Institute in 1998. I'd like to think I'm good at cooking uh, because of that. I do love it. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son who eats about 40,000 calories a day, so I'm, I am often cooking uh, when, I'm, when he's in my care. Uh, I did work uh, briefly as a line cook at Babo Restaurant when I worked for Mario Batali. I've done a lot of catering and private cooking for individuals. So uh, I never really fully pulled the trigger as a restaurant cook. I think I'm a little too um, thin-skinned, and uh, I don't know. I just I never quite uh, I, I could never quite make the commitment to that to that life. But I deeply respect people who who do. Well, on, uh, we've alluded to the, um, the kitchen culture, if you will, and towards uh, the end of his life, um, 
Anthony was very interested in the Me Too movement and particularly changing the way uh, women were perceived and um, treated in hospitality and particularly in the kitchen. What, uh, what influences can you, can you see that he's brought to that? Um, what, um, how, uh, how has he changed the dialogue? Well, uh, you know, I think that the most important influence that he had at that time, this was late 2017, was just using his extraordinary platform. You know, he had, I don't know, 1.2 million Twitter followers and several hundred thousand Instagram followers. And, and it you know, wouldn't take much for him to say anything in public and that becomes its own news cycle. So I think really the fact that he, as a, as a man, as a straight man, as a veteran of the restaurant industry, that he was willing to, to talk about these things in a very aggressive way that uh, not everyone uh, wanted to. I mean, he had the luxury of, of no longer being in the business and, and really being able to, uh, to say, say what he believed to be true about, about these, uh, these issues. He established himself as a good early ally among the, uh, that's, that group. Yes, and, I would say so. And so that uh, influence, we ho hope, will continue going forward mm -hmm. on that. And something uh, that you do bring out in, in your in your. Hang on, oh. that you do bring out in the. <laughs> <laughs> I realize I, I should show the product occasionally. <laughs> and I think we have a, some more questions. Yes, in the please. Program. There we yes. Well, sure. You know, there's uh, you know, there's so uh, so much kind of second guessing and trying to piece things together in the wake of a suicide. Uh, Tony was a very private person, uh, even you know, with people that he spent a lot of time with. He really kind of set the boundaries, and so if he wanted to talk about something, he would. But it was not something that you would necessarily ask about, uh, and. You know, we, we probably had a, f a few, very few conversations of that nature over the time that I that I worked with him, but it wasn't really a topic of discussion. Uh, you know, I wanted I wanted to believe that that things were as beautiful as he often said that they were, uh, and if I had my own doubts or suspicions, it was, you know, to be frank, it was outside the scope of my work, and I knew that. He was not somebody who wanted to be fussed over. He didn't want to be chased. And so if he didn't ask for help, it was very, very difficult to maintain the trust uh, and, and, and breach a boundary that was very, very clear. Uh, you know, he, was, he, never, uh, he never claimed to be a sober person. He wrote about kicking heroin and cocaine. And I think a lot of people took that to mean that he was somebody that had, you know, gone through a 12-step program and gotten sober. But he was very clear that that was not, uh, that's not how he personally, uh, you know, kicked narcotics. So I think, yes, he drank. He drank on camera, um, you know. I, I, but I don't know, you know, again, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to make a, um, a diagnosis or, or a, you know, to really definitively say it was this or it was that. And we've got one question in the side gallery. I'll be right back. Just please, please. So the, I'll summarize the question. Um, the, as the um, thank you. As the shows, uh, as the years went on with the shows, they started to get more. Uh, the, the questions moved away from strictly food and and things uh, was de a deeper exploration of culture, sometimes politics, speaking with journalists, uh, dissidents, politicians. And the question is, where uh, where did that come from? Was that a was that a uh, a mandate from Tony? Was that from the producers? Um, we, we have a producer here in the audience, uh, so I, I'm hesitant to answer, uh, you know, for someone who actually, who's, whose job was, was uh, much more closely aligned with that. But I will say, 
uh, my understanding is that it was all of the above. Uh, you know, that as, as time went on, it was like, well, how do we keep this, how do we keep pushing forward? How do we keep learning more? How do we keep bringing more to our audiences? Uh, you know, we can't just keep uh, eating gigantic cheeseburgers and, you know, weird insects. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we need to, we need to, we want to learn more, we want to teach more, uh, but in, a, in an entertaining, I mean, I don't think the word teach ever came up, but we want to uh, share more, inform more. Uh, so I think it was a, a function of, of Tony wanting to go deeper and of the people that, that worked with him, uh, you know, being on the same page, wanting to, uh, to, to bring uh, more interesting television, and then also a change from uh, the basic cable uh, travel channel to CNN, uh, which I think is just it was a natural fit to uh, to to start to blend in politics and culture and religion and journalism and all these different aspects of of human life uh, into the stories that they were telling. Did I did I do okay, Helen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, let's see, we had no, I, excuse, uh, all right. I, I'll get to you. I saw you first. Um, so thank you so much. I grew up watching you guys on CNN. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think I watched his shows from elementary school all the way through college. And um, I, yeah, thank you so much. And I am curious about the lasting legacy that you think that um, he would like to have imparted on us. I think growing up seeing this personality develop and all of these amazing stories on the screen um, to then be so cut short and have this really shocking experience to sort of unfortunately taint a lot of those early super positive experiences. Um, so I'm curious what you would say about the lasting legacy and what you think he would want us to mm. know and learn from his mm. his abundant life. Yeah. Well, it's always you know again I'm, I sort of give, always give the caveat like I don't I it's impossible for me to say you know what he might be thinking or to you know I, I'm always very careful to not speak on his behalf. But uh, you know my my observation and and the things the conversations that I've had with people uh, after before and after his death uh, is that he. Uh, the the light that he's shown on the back of the house in restaurants and the front of the house in restaurants, the 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 real labor issues, the beauty, the creativity, uh, the hard work, the struggles, all, the humor, uh, everything that goes into uh, working in the hospitality industry. I think that that is a legacy that that is you know that is one of the biggest impacts I think that he had on the culture is really helping people to understand, uh, you know, what it is, what, what is downstairs, uh, or, or is it upstairs? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, you know, the, I think that I, so many people have said to me that, that they feel that he really uh, brought some, some self-respect uh, to people who worked in this industry that was long overlooked and long, uh, you know, considered sort of a, a first stop after the army and the last stop after or before you go to jail. Uh, and, and really elevated, you know, what it is. I know that it had a big impact on uh, enrollment in culinary schools and the kinds of people uh, that, that would that started to gravitate toward the industry. Uh, so I think that's that's a lasting legacy. And then I think you know, telling your own story, finding finding the humor and the pathos in telling your own story of your family, of your work, of your education, of your friends and the people around you. I mean, he certainly wasn't the first person to to write entertaining autobiography couched as nonfiction, but I think that uh, he, he definitely inspired a lot of other people to look around and say, you know, what's interesting about about my life as a librarian or an auto mechanic or a cook or a, you know, whatever, a zookeeper, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that he had a bigger impact on, on literature than he might have uh, ever wanted to admit. And let's see, there was one other, yes, in gray. Sure. So the question is about the documentary uh, called Roadrunner that came out in 2021, same year as, as the two books. Uh, I was a consulting producer 
on it. It was a, you know, basically I was helping the, uh, the director and, and his colleagues uh, make connections, talking to people that I knew to, uh, you know, help them decide whether or not they wanted to do interviews, uh, you know, providing a lot of uh, just factual information to the producers. Uh, I was really uh, disheartened to see the discourse around the film get derailed by this conversation about AI. And if, you, if you're not aware of the, of the controversy, uh, there was a probably a 45 second uh, segment of the film where there was some technology, AI technology used so that there were words that Tony had written in an email to a friend and uh, he, but he hadn't spoken them out loud in a recorded way. And so this software was used to make it sound as if he was saying the words. Uh, and it's, I understand why some people will be uncomfortable with it, but it was, again, 45 seconds in a two hour documentary in which there was a lot of, of Tony's actual voice. Every other instance in the film where you hear Tony speaking, that was his voice. They had access to a lot of, uh, all of the uh, television and you know his audio books and interviews. And so there was this really rich, um, trove of, of material that was used for the film. So personally, I, I felt that it was really a shame and I, f I felt very uh, badly for the director, Morgan Neville, that the, that the discourse was so centered on this little bit of AI. And I think it was very easy for people to have kind of a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, Tony would have hated this. Well, you know, if you've seen the film, the first uh, minute of the film, Tony is saying, I don't care what happens to my body when I die, you know, throw me in a wood chipper and spray me into Harrods at rush hour. So, <laughs> you know, to then clutch pearls and say, oh, Tony would have hated this AI. I don't, you know, there were all kinds of filmmaking techniques that got used uh, in his, his own television shows. So, you know, maybe, maybe he would have hated it. I mean, he was an unpredictable guy and maybe he would have been very upset, but I don't, I don't, for me personally, it didn't take away from, from the film. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always going to say that whenever it comes <laughs> up. <laughs> well, that's a, quite, a, quite a graphic image for sure. <laughs> okay, remember. I do recall there was, yes, gentleman in the back. Thank you. All right. Sure. You know, I would say that every single interview that I did with somebody, there was there was new information that I hadn't known. And I thought, you know, just by working closely with him, being his assistant and working on these books, that I, I surely I knew everything about him. He was an open book. And that was not the case. So every one of uh, over 90 interviews I did had something new to me. Uh, something kind of light but really funny that came up a lot was uh, Tony being really into tanning, getting, getting a suntan in a competitive way that, that was, you know, if you look at him, it's like, oh, well, this, you know, he does like to have a tan and he's a, a tan guy. But a, a number of his colleagues from uh, Kitchens in the 1980s talked about how it was, it was literally a competition uh, where they would, you know, they would work all night, uh, party, drink, uh, maybe have a couple of hours of sleep and then go out on the train to Long Beach and, and really try very athletically to get as tan as possible. <laughs> and I just love that. It's just like, of course, you know, it, 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 Tony sort of, everything he did, he did to a thousand percent. So I was like, I'm not going to just go to the beach. I'm going to like, I'm going to be like George Hamilton, you know, I'm going to get <laughs> the tan. Uh, so that, you know, that kind of stuff really, um, you know, and that's the, the kind of stuff that you can only get from talking to people that, you know, that knew him, you know, way back when. So that was a re real tan. Yeah, <laughs> <It> yeah. No... <laughs> All right, let's see in the back there. So the question is, is there a dish or a food that reminds me particularly of Tony? I mean, there are, there are a, a lot of them. You know, a lot of the, I, I do cook out of our book, Appetites. Just a, a little plug in there for that. Uh, but, you know, the thing that, that always kind of gets me is, uh, is roast chicken. Uh, because he, uh, that's, that's a recipe from uh, the Leal cookbook. Uh, everyone can make a roast. Not everyone, but most people. If you cook, you can make a roast chicken, right? And... Uh, there's a really bit of uh, a funny bit of writing that he that he um, you know in the in the headnote, 
And his technique, I think, was really, really good, uh, which is to start it, I believe it's to start it high and then go low. Uh, and, and he says, you know, you don't need to trust the chicken. You can just sort of poke a, a hole uh, in the skin and then just tuck the legs in. And it's just, so should whenever- we, Should I, we have a hair dryer? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the hair dryer came later. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, so whenever I roast a chicken, I always, I always think of Tony. There we go. You know, it's not really. Oh, yes, sure. So the question is, uh, you know, were there people or, you know, what, what is the nature of, of certain friendships that Tony had where they, they did fully connect? I'm not sure I can really answer that. I, I think, you know, again, in, in talking to people that, that, that were very close to him, even those people, I didn't have that conversation with Eric, so I can't weigh in on, on that relationship. But I think that even people who were very close to him observed at times, a, a kind of remove. I think there were uh, probably a very few exceptions, but but I think he was he was someone who who did retreat and did always keep a little bit of a, of a wall. And it wasn't that it was a completely impermeable wall. It was just uh, e very much on his terms. Uh, someone did say in the book, I forget who, that you know they they knew better than to than to push or to press because once the iron gate came down, it wasn't going back up. And that was for, for people who wanted a little too much or who asked a few too many questions or tried to offer a little too much advice. You know, it was sort of, uh, I mean, this gets into sort of armchair psychology, but this thing of, you know, wanting, wanting to break away from your mother and maybe secretly still wanting to be mothered, but really rejecting the, you know, I, I say this now as a, the mother of a 14-year-old and it's very push-pull and, and so I, th I think, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a, uh, a, a parallel to be made there. Okay, uh, Tarzan, hang on, we did have one question waiting in the back there. If, if Tarzan, yeah, <laughs> hang on. Whoever's phone that is, that's a, that's a good ringtone. <laughs> okay, okay. Hang on just a second, it. we'll get there. He did not, to my knowledge, have a secret social media for his friends, or at least I was not. Uh, <laughs> I was not on that private list. Uh, he, <laughs> he, I think he liked social media quite a bit. I think it was, uh, you know, really fun for him at a lot of times, you know, to sort of throw a grenade out there and see what happened, or you know, you you end up getting, you know, he he was a fan. He he had his people that he was enamored of as much as anyone else. And to get to have that kind of instant contact with artists or musicians or writers that he admired, I think that was really, could be really fun and exciting for him. He did have sometimes people helping him. I mean, there was, you know, I think there's this new, it's not so new anymore, but it, it was new uh, maybe 10 years ago, this this business side of things where you, you have a certain obligation to promote a show or promote a product or whatever your business relationships are, in that case, you do have uh, sometimes somebody helping you, you know, timed uh, social media posts or whatever. But I think, um, uh, you know, for the, I'd say 90% of the time, he was, he was uh, it, it was strictly him, and, and that 10% were, were things that were more sort of obligations. He had a whiskey endorsement, you know, CNN had certain requirements of him, and, and so in that case, he did have... Uh, he did have some assistance. And we had I would one, like we'll take a few more and then we will, well, we can keep going. I, you know, you, you, we're here, we're good. We're, we're here all going? night. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Yes, go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. So the question is, who did Tony like to read? I mean, he was a voracious reader. Uh, his bookshelves were just just packed with books, uh, and 
you know, spy novels, uh, you know, books about uh, the Cold War, books about war in general. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was a big Graham Greene fan. He was a big uh, Hunter S. Thompson fan. Um, John le Carré, uh, you know, all the great, great, uh, you know, spy novelists. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, George Orwell, he was a big, big fan of George Orwell. I'm sure there are a million writers that I'm, that I'm not remembering. He did the New York Times book section. He did the, uh, the buy the book uh, column at one point. I think it's when we were promoting Appetite. So it would have been fall 2016. Um, and, he, and he spoke at length about, you know, what he was reading at the time. So that's worth digging up if you get into the New York Times archive. Uh, I, I don't know that he read cookbooks recreationally. It's possible. I mean, again, he was such a voracious reader and he could kind of, you know, start and end a, a book in a night. I mean, he just was a very fast reader. So I think there probably were classic books that he was interested in. I don't know that he was out there buying, you know, every season's new uh, Ina Garten, but... Maybe, you know, again, he was full of surprises, so. Well, let's see, there were a few, so let me say a few new people and then we will conclude, yes, new questions? Yes, good. You know, I, I didn't, and that's, uh, you know, a after the fact, I, I, that's slight regret. I, well, actually, that's not true. There were, there were a few guys that were his, um, his classmates. I, mean, I, I, I approached them more as just friends, you know, guys from the neighborhood, but I guess they were, in fact, his classmates, Sam Goldman. Uh, his, his first wife, Nancy Bourdain, was one of his classmates. Uh, there were a couple of other guys that, uh, that he met uh, when he enrolled, I believe he was in junior high. So, um, you know, they didn't, I don't think school was a big priority for them. <laughs> it was more about uh, smoking weed and riding their bikes, but, uh, but yeah, there and are. And tanning. And tanning, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, in the early chapters, there are, there are a few uh, guys that he, um, that he was friends with in school. Uh, I know there are many more, um, there are other books uh, where, where more, uh, you know, even faculty, I think, that knew him way back when uh, I have talked. Uh, so um, yeah, it was, it was the, the Englewood, Dwight Englewood School. Um. All right, and so third time's a charm, sir. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, he was, he was a really interesting guy. He was, um, uh, you know, there, there will not be another there. And, and, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of people who try to, uh, pitch television shows and books. I want to be the Anthony Bourdain of beekeeping and I want to be the Anthony Bourdain of professional wrestling. And it's like, well, you know, it's do your own thing. He's created uh, his, 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 his own, his own he, style. Yeah. Well, and so I, why don't we take, take one more question for the gentleman in the back and we'll, Tremendous. Well, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great, great. If, if why don't we? Why don't I end on that note by by saying that um, as longtime foodies, as longtime New Yorkers, you know, Brasserie Leal was just up the street, not but maybe a five, eight minute walk from here. And so, this evening we have come as physically and as professionally 
as close as we possibly can, I think, to understanding the late, great Anthony Bourdain. Thank you. Thank you very much.